automatonophobia is the fear of figures that look human but aren't. Some examples of this include mannequins, robots, dolls, wax figures, or even statues. This is also referred to as the uncanny valley. The sense of unease that human-like appearance of something non-human might evoke in something. Things that look human but aren't. And how uncomfortable that might make you feel. This is something that I think everyone has experienced at least once in some way. And with that unease comes urban legends. Stories about how that mannequin that you just went by may just be more than just a prop. And some of these urban legends are based in reality. This is the story of Elmer McCurdy. While it was the events after his death that led to Elmer becoming known, he was once a person who lived. So let's look at that life. Elmer McCurdy was born in Washington, Maine on January 1st, 1880. His mother, 17-year-old Sadie McCurdy, was unmarried and it's unknown who Elmer's father was. Though it's been speculated that it could have been a man named Charles Smith, who was Sadie's cousin. And this speculation is largely due to an alias that Elmer later used. A young, unmarried woman raising an illegitimate child would only mean a life filled with hardships for both Sadie and Elmer. So to spare them both from this, Sadie's brother George and his wife Helen decided to adopt Elmer and raise him as their own. They would also take in Sadie. This was the life that Elmer knew for the first 10 years of his life. Until 1890, when George died of tuberculosis. After the death of the man that Elmer believed to be his father, the family relocated to the city of Bangor in Maine. At some point during his teenage years, Sadie would tell Elmer the truth of who his parents were, who his mother really was, and the fact that his father was unknown. Understandably, this news would upend the life that Elmer thought that he had. In fact, this news would disturb him so much that he grew resentful, becoming unruly, rebellious, and taking up drinking, a habit that he would never be able to shake. At some point, Elmer would move in with his grandfather and began working as an apprentice plumber. This job did offer some stability and Elmer would live a comfortable life for a while, but that too would change. In 1898, he lost his job due to an economic downturn, and things for Elmer only got worse from there. Two years later, in the year 1900, his mother, though it's unclear if this is referring to Sadie or Helen, died of a ruptured ulcer, and only two months later, his grandfather would die of Bright's disease. Now, most of his family was gone, so Elmer decided to leave Maine. He would then drift around the eastern United States, working odd jobs here and there as both a lead miner and as a plumber. But his excessive drinking that he had kept up ever since the news of his true parentage led to him not being able to hold down a job for any extended period. Eventually, he found himself in Sherryvale, Kansas, where he worked as a plumber for a time. For reasons that are unclear, Elmer would leave Sherryvale and relocate to Iola, Kansas. This is where he ended up having his first run-in with the law after being arrested for public intoxication in 1905. 
Shortly after that, he relocated again. This time he went to Webb City, Missouri, where he would join the United States Army in 1907. During his service, he was assigned to Fort Leavenworth, where he operated a machine gun, and he would also receive minimal training to use nitroglycerin for demolition purposes. Elmer would remain with the army until he was honorably discharged from the Quartermaster Corps on November 7, 1910. Now Elmer went back to drifting, and he would travel to St. Joseph, Kansas, where he met up with a friend that he had made while serving in the army. The pair would be arrested on November 19th that same year for possessing burglary paraphernalia, such as chisels, gunpowder, and money sacks. During the arrangement, the men would claim that they were working on a foot-operated machine gun, and that's what they were using the tools for. Elmer was found not guilty in January 1911 by a jury. However, this was only the beginning of Elmer McCurdy's life of crime. But he wasn't exactly good at this new career. Elmer often tried to incorporate the training he had received with nitroglycerin into his robberies, but he would often fail to calculate the proper amount of nitroglycerin to use, which led to him failing more often than not one example of this is in March 1911. Elmer had relocated to Lenapa, Oklahoma, and he had joined up with three other men. They planned to rob the Iron Mountain Missouri Pacific train number 104 after Elmer had heard a rumor that one of the cars contained a safe with $4,000. $130,000. Today. The group would successfully stop the train and locate the safe. But this is also where Elmer screwed up. He put nitroglycerin on the safe's door to blast it open. But he did not correctly determine how much of it to use and would use way too much, which ended up destroying both the safe and most of the money inside. Which meant that instead of the $4,000 that they were after, the group ended up getting around $100 to $500 in silver coins, most of which were melted and fused to the safe's frame after the explosion. After this failed robbery, the men split up and went their separate ways. Elmer would travel back to Kansas, but it wouldn't be long before he had joined up with another pair of attempted robbers. In September that same year, this new group planned to rob the Citizens Bank. On the day of the robbery, they spent two hours breaking through the bank wall with a hammer. After doing that, Elmer placed a nitroglycerin charge around the door of the bank's outer vault. The resulting blast would completely destroy the interior, but this time it did not damage the safe inside the vault. Still, having learned nothing from his previous failures, Elmer decided to blow the safe door open. This time, however, he could not get the charge to ignite. One of the group was the lookout, and at some point something would scare him enough that he decided to run off. This alerted the group that there was potentially trouble coming, so they all decided to flee as well. They still hadn't gotten the safe open. Refusing to leave empty-handed, the men would grab the coins that were in a tray outside the safe before fleeing. Meaning that once again, Elmer only got scraps instead of the riches he was after. The men then hopped on a train that took them to the Kansas border later that same night. After getting off the train, they decided to split up. Elmer had a friend living on a ranch near Bartlesville, Oklahoma. So he decided to head there to hide from whatever law enforcement that might be coming after him. For the next few weeks, Elmer remained at the ranch. He stayed in a hay shed on the property where he spent most of his time drinking. Elmer McCurdy was nothing if not persistent. Despite all of these failures, he was not ready to give up his life of crime just yet. 
So on October 4th, 1911, he and some new accomplices set out to rob another bank in Oklahoma. The intended target was a train that reportedly contained $400,000 in cash that was intended as royalty payment to the Osage nation. But once again, there was a screw up and the men ended up stopping a passenger train instead. All they ended up getting was $46, a revolver, a coat, the conductor's watch, and two jugs of whiskey. A newspaper that reported on this crime would mockingly call it one of the smallest in the history of train robbery. Disappointed and annoyed at yet another failed robbery, Elmer returned to the ranch and spent his time in that same hayshed drinking the whiskey that he had stolen. Unbeknownst to Elmer, this time he had been implicated in the crime. A reward for his capture had been issued and the police were looking for him. Using bloodhounds, a posse of three deputy sheriffs tracked Elmer to the hay shed on the ranch. After surrounding the shed, they decided to wait for daylight before moving in. As he was drunk at the time they approached, Elmer did not notice the deputies until around 7 o'clock in the morning. But as soon as he did notice them, he grabbed his gun and began shooting. The first shot missed his target, and three more shots would follow as the deputies dove behind cover. This fighter fight would go on for about an hour. Then the gunshots abruptly stopped. It was now very quiet. The deputies would remain behind cover for a moment or two before cautiously stepping out from their cover and approaching the shed, where they would find Elmer McCurdy dead on the ground. He had been killed by a single gunshot wound to the chest which he sustained while he was lying down. Who fired the lethal bullet is unclear, but the life of Elmer McCurdy was over. Elmer McCurdy's body would be taken to the undertaker in Pahuska, Oklahoma. As he had no real family left at this point, his remains went unclaimed. The undertaker, a man named Joseph L. Johnson, would embalm the body with an arsenic-based preservative. He then shaved Elmer's face, dressed him in a suit, and placed him in the back of his funeral home. During this time, in cases where no next of kin were known, this method was used to preserve a body for a long period, just in case there is someone who does come to claim the body. But in the case of Elmer McCurdy, no one did. Johnson refused to bury or releasing the body. The reason for this was that he was determined that he be paid for his services. Eventually, he came up with the idea of making Elmer work off his debt. Johnson would then dress Elmer in street clothes, place a rifle in his hand, and stood him up in the corner of the funeral home. For a nickel, visitors could come and view the bandit who would not give up. Also known as the mystery man of many aliases, the Oklahoma outlaw, and the embalmed bandit. This morbid exhibition would become a very popular attraction at the funeral home, which eventually drew the attention of carnival promoters, which in turn led to Johnson receiving numerous offers to buy the body, offers that he refused. This would go on for a few years until October 6, 1916, when a man contacted the funeral home and claimed to be Elmer McCurdy's long-lost brother from California. He told Johnson that he had already contacted the county sheriff and a local attorney to get permission to take custody of the body so that he could ship it to San Francisco for a proper burial. He also let Johnson know that he would soon be arriving at the funeral home to collect the body. And he did turn up at the funeral home the next day. With him was another man who called himself Wayne, who also claimed to be McCurdy's long-lost brother. 
Believing this story, Johnson released the body to these two men. The body was then promptly put on a train, but not to San Francisco for any burial. No, the body was shipped to Arkansas City in Kansas. The two men who claimed to be Elmer McCurdy's long-lost brothers were in fact James and Charles Patterson, owners of a traveling carnival called the Great Patterson Carnival Shows. After hearing stories of the popular embalmed bandit exhibit, the brothers wanted to use it in their carnival. But they had also heard that Johnson refused to sell the body to anyone. So they instead came up with this scheme of pretending to be McCurdy's brothers, as they knew that this was the only way of getting their hands on their new attraction. Elmer McCurdy was then put on display in Patterson's Traveling Carnival under the name The Outlaw Who Would Never Be Captured Alive. And there he remained until 1922, when Louis Sonny, head of an entertainment company in California, acquired the body. McCurdy would then be used in Sonny's Traveling Museum of Crime. This was a show that featured wax replicas of famous outlaws such as Bill Doolin and Jesse James and it would tour up and down the West Coast until sometime in the 1940s. Aside from being part of this traveling show, McCurdy's body would also move from gig to gig over the years. For instance, in 1928, he was part of the official sideshow that accompanied the Trans-American Foot Race. And in 1933, it was also used to promote a film called Narcotic. After Louis Sonny passed away in 1949, Elmer's body was placed in storage in a Los Angeles warehouse. Aside from being used as a prop for another movie, the body remained in storage until 1968, when it was sold along with other wax figures for $10,000 to Spoonie Singh, the owner of the Hollywood Wax Museum. At this point, most people, like Singh, thought that this body was just a wax figure. A really creepy, eerily lifelike wax figure. Singh had bought the body for two Canadian men who planned to exhibit it in a show at Mount Rushmore. During this exhibition, the body would be damaged, with the tips of the ears, some fingers and toes being blown off. When the body was returned to Singh, he felt that it now looked too gruesome. And ironically, he also felt that this wax figure was not lifelike enough. The wax figure would eventually be sold to Ed Lirsch, who was part owner of the Pike. The Pike was an amusement zone with several independent arcades, food stands, gift shops, a variety of rides, and a grand bathhouse that was located in Long Beach, California. It was here that the truth of this wax figure would finally be revealed. The Six Million Dollar Man was an American science fiction and action TV show about a former astronaut that was rebuilt with bionic implants after a NASA test flight accident. These implants would give him superhuman strength, speed, and vision, which led to him being employed as a secret agent by a fictional US government office, Office of Scientific Intelligence. One episode in the series was called Carnival of Spies, where an East German scientist fakes a heart attack and slips away from a high-level scientific conference, and he ends up with a traveling carnival. The episode was going to be filmed in the funhouse called Laugh in the Dark at the Pike. On December 8, 1976, in preparation for filming, the prop men would remove some of the mannequins. One of the men went to move a strange-looking wax-covered mannequin that was hanging from a rope from the ceiling. As he grabbed the arm of this figure, it broke off in his hand, 
and to his horror, he saw a human bone sticking out from the arm. The police were immediately notified, and the body was taken to the Los Angeles coroner's office. After cutting through the wax covering the body, an autopsy was conducted the following day, which determined that this was indeed a human body, a human male who had died of a gunshot wound to the chest. The investigators were now trying to figure out who this man was and when he died. Was this a new crime or a cold case? The body was completely petrified. It had been covered in wax and layers of phosphorus paint. It still had some hair on the sides and back of the head. The ears, toes and fingers were missing from the injury that was sustained at the show at Mount Rushmore. They also found that the man had suffered from tuberculosis. But it was a gunshot that took his life. And while the bullet was long gone, the bullet jacket was found. This was determined to be a gas check, a gasket type component of firearms ammunition, which were first used in 1905 until 1940. They would also find traces of arsenic in the tissue, which was a component of embalming fluid until the late 1920s. As if those clues weren't enough to pinpoint the era in which this man had died, they also found a 1924 penny and ticket stub to Lewis Sonny's Museum of Crime inside the man's mouth. The investigators then would contact Dan Sonny, who was the son of Lewis Sonny. Dan was actually the one who had sold the body in 1968, and he confirmed that the body was that of a man named Elmer McCurdy. Still, they needed to be sure. After forensic anthropologist Dr. Clyde Snow superimposed radiographs of the skull over a photo of McCurdy that was taken around the time of his death, it was determined that the skull was that of Elmer McCurdy. The history of displaying human bodies goes back centuries. For instance, the Paris morgue would display the bodies of unknown persons behind the morgue's large plate glass window in the hopes that someone would walk by and recognize them. Museums all over the world exhibit human remains. And then you have the modern exhibitions that showcase human bodies such as Bodies, the Exhibition, and Body Worlds. Morbid curiosity have always existed, but in the case of Elmer McCurdy, it seems that greed was the main motivation, or at the very least a determination to get your money after doing a job, which started with the funeral director deciding to use the body to make money, and ending with traveling carnivals, movies, and amusement parks. Elmer McCurdy was finally laid to rest in 1977. Approximately 300 people, including many of the crew from the Six Million Dollar Man, attended his funeral. His body now resides in the Summit View Cemetery in Guthrie, Oklahoma, in a casket that is covered in two feet of concrete to make sure that Elmer McCurdy finally gets to rest. <laughs> 